Welcome to the Shanghai International Circuit. We're here in the very picturesque paddock of this track where Formula One is going to celebrate its 1000th World Championship race on Sunday. Of course, there have been some great races over the years, really fantastic battles, famous drivers and cars, and we're hoping this weekend will be one to remember up with the best of them. Now, we thought it would be a good chance to look back at some of the key races in the history of the World Championship. Key races not so much for what happened on track, but for the significance of an achievement, of something that happened, something that has changed the way Formula One is. I'm joined by Stuart Codling, who will be offering his expertise on, on these moments. And we're not going to start with the first World Championship Grand Prix back in 1950 at Silverstone, won by Giuseppe Farina, Alfa Romeo driver, of course. But we're going to go all the way to 1959, the United States Grand Prix. Why? Still before both of us were born, but a very significant race because that was the first World Championship for a rear-engine car. Yeah, of course, the Cooper T51, driven by Jack Brabham, pushed the car across the line famously, although there's a little bit of a myth about that, isn't there? He didn't have to because of the drop score rule. He could have just have coasted to the finish or just uh, sat and sparked one up. Exactly. And whatever happens, that meant that that would win the World Championship. And that changed Formula One, didn't it? It meant the engine was, was behind the driver. That's the, the default for Formula One cars for forevermore. Yeah, it, it was genre defining in a way. And also for me, the really interesting thing about throughout that decade is the way that the rear engine revolution kind of stuttered into being and then really ov overtook everything very, very quickly. In many ways, it's incorrect to call it a revolution because there had been uh, cars with, with engines at the rear in the 1930s, very successful Grand Prix cars. It's just that that technology seemed to lie fallow for a little while. And it was only sort of the small British manufacturers really, like Cooper, that picked it up again uh, in the post-war years. And then only through expediency because they were using motorcycle engines for their Formula 3 cars. And obviously if you're using a motorcycle engine and transmission, you want it as near the driven wheel as possible because you're using a chain. And they then went, went up the ladder as it were use that because they were familiar with it. You had two Grand Prix wins for those cars at the beginning of 1958, but even then people thought it was an outlier. They just thought you know, Argentina 58 was Sterling being clever. Well, then we move on to 1967, the Dutch Grand Prix. Now, this is another engine one, but wow, what an engine. Yeah, it was one that in, in some way, shape or form would could really dominate Formula One for another decade and a half. The Ford DFV, exclusive to Lotus that year, a structural part of the car, also something that wasn't necessarily brand new, it had been done to a, a small extent in the 1950s with uh, the Lancia D50, but no one had actually used the car, uh, used the engine as a complete structural member and used that to save weight to make a much more competitive car. And it was such a step, competitive out of the box, and but for you know quirks of reliability, might have even won more races in that season, and it absolutely moved the game on. Well, and it became the ubiquitous Formula One engine, almost everyone used it, not quite 100% of everyone, but it was it was part of your, your Formula One car, it was what you needed. Just a member of the Renault team walking past there with his mobile phone going off. That's the fantastic uh, ditty he had it playing was good. from I, his I, car. I like that, of course, the working paddock, so there's, there's lots going on, lots of preparations going on for the race. Now our third car, well our third race, 1977 British Grand Prix. Not a very successful outing for this car, but the yellow teapot as it was called was the, the harbinger of what was to come, wasn't it? The strange thing about that, of course, was that it did what everyone expected it to do, which was to blow up, which is why they disparaged it as a teapot. And I, I almost feel sorry for Renault in a way, because having really been the innovators there, like, like lots of entrepreneurs and innovators, they didn't really reap the, the, the long-term rewards of their innovation. It was people who picked it up and improved on it who did uh, better once Formula once once turbos became de rigueur in Formula One, you saw Ferrari, Honda, uh, the, the, the tag Porsche engine, which was fantastically successful in the 1980s. All of them won races and absolutely dominated the sport, whereas Renault struggled for reliability and then fell apart with their own team, having not really won anywhere near as many Grand Prix as they should have done. And of course, soon, everybody followed, even Ferrari, who weren't keen on turbo engines. Yeah, Enzo, Enzo would have been furious at having to do a turbo engine. But this is one of those uh, one of those moments when there's a, a complete change in the technology, and then soon we had these these monstrous 1,000 brake horsepower. In many cases, much much more in qualifying trim engines. That every driver who raced them looks back on them very very fondly, and I think fans do as well. People people look back on that era and say halcyon days. But actually, there, there were dominant cars then. But also technologically it was fantastically interesting when you think the BMW engine was based on a road car engine and yet they were able to manage 
over a thousand brake horsepower, as you say, allegedly in qualifying trim. And there were so many stories about how they managed to toughen the, the structure. There were stories that the, the chief engineer used to send his staff out to urinate on the blocks when they were outside because he thought that would condition them. I think that's a myth. There's also the Nazi rocket fuel theory, which has since been disproved. But it just goes to show what people would do to extract all that power. There's, there's no real doubt that a lot of the fuels were probably very toxic and you wouldn't have wanted to spill any of it on you. Well, of course, turbos were outlawed ahead of the 1989 season, but we're going to roll forward to 1994, the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. Now, for any motor racing fan, that the name of that, that, that race of that, that weekend brings spring sadness. It was a tragic weekend. Formula One lost Roland Ratzenberger and the great Ayrton Senna. But, Stuart, it wasn't just because of the loss of those drivers that it's remembered, but it was what followed, and it really defined Formula One as it was not just in the next decade, but even up to today. I think to Formula One and the FIA's great credit, although there were a few semi-knee-jerk responses to safety, you know, installing chicanes in Spain, for instance. Which, in retrospect, was... actually, it's admitted those were perhaps a little bit knee-jerky and were not necessarily a good idea. Yeah. Beyond that, a lot of the work that went on was rigorous, it was responsible, and I think Formula One had got to a point where the, the risks were not being assessed properly. The car performance was increasing at an incredible rate. The technology w was increasing. The, it, it, it really, what we were pushing the boundaries of what was possible, certainly pushing the boundaries of what the drivers could control. Uh, and a lot of the technologies involved were reducing the feel they had, things like traction control, certainly active suspension was a very very tricky thing to manage for a driver a lot of it was based on faith you know you say adrian newey explained that nigel mansell was so much better than ricardo patrese and he actively suspended williams because the car had no feel at all when you were at the limit but nigel had the the bravery to push through it whereas ricardo kind of went oh you know i don't know what's happening here i, I don't really want to drive this so that that was a risk and it took a couple of years for for the, for the risk of turning into an actual incident. And for, for me, the great triumph of Formula One after that is that it took on more responsibility, the, the risks were assessed more rigorously. We, we kind of, nowadays, we, we live in a world where we do accept, people talk about health and safety gone mad, but we do assess risk in a much more intelligent way. And rightly so. Nobody wants to see drivers seriously hurt or worse. And I think the, yeah, the, the taking responsibility and the trying to make sure that these things are preempted rather than just reacting to something going tragically wrong and you learning there's a weakness they were preempting and while sometimes that's criticized the halo being a great example it's the kind of thing that when you have an accident like we saw at the start of the belgian grand prix last year that's when you realize that sometimes the preemptive moves can be quite a quite a good one i think very often the the, the problem that you have when assessing things like this is that you're you're judging something based on events that haven't happened that that thing you've put in place has prevented from happening whereas it's very easy to be reactive and to wait for something to happen and then you know close off a particular development route or, or stop something from happening once you've observed it and the final race we're going to talk about this one might not ring so many bells the 2010 canadian grand prix now that was a very significant race for slightly different reasons Stuart Cotton. Yeah, it was one of the first high deg races and certainly one that inspired the present generation of tyres we've got. And it, it really was very interesting. That was the year we, we got rid of refuelling because that was supposed to spice up the show. We had a lot of one-stop races that were criticised for making it very boring. All of a sudden in Canada, the super soft tyres were just basically melting like old chewing gum. Yeah, and that meant we had multi-stop races. They'd all been one-stoppers up until that point. So it's just a thrilling race and everyone said, yeah, this is the way to go, for better or worse, of course. Yeah. Bernie woke up the next day and uh, issued the directive that all races must be like this from here on. And now we have the, the present generation of tyres where the, the tyre manufacturer has been told you must make tyres that degrade rapidly, rapidly to spice up the show. But it's very difficult to engineer scenarios like that deliberately. And I really feel for Pirelli because tyres are the sort of thing that drivers complain about constantly, whether they're either degrading too fast or not degrading at all. So it seems that you can't please anyone. Well... Who knows what the 1,000th World Championship race will bring? We just discussed a few of them and some of the key moments. Of course, we could have discussed many, many more, but we'd have been here for rather a long time because it's been an illustrious, illustrious history in the World Championship. It's no wonder that Formula One is making such an effort to celebrate. Let's hope the Chinese Grand Prix is worthy of this landmark race.